Thank you for listening in on my latest update. Last week, among other topics I spoke about, I particularly addressed our economy and our community being open and also being able to enjoy more of the summertime places currently available to us, our athletic fields, parks, and beaches. We have had much success in managing this virus at a local level here in Newburyport, and yet we all know the virus is still here and it's still very dangerous. And our best defense is still to keep our distance, wear face coverings, and wash our hands. If you're listening to the news, while hospitalizations and deaths are down in our state, positive cases are rising, and the state is watching this very closely. The increase comes as we see large group gatherings and instances of people ignoring wearing masks or not properly social distancing. If you plan to come this weekend to downtown Newburyport or to walk the boardwalk and rail trail, please bring your face covering with you. You'll need it. With the many visitors coming to town and crowds of people in the downtown and waterfront areas, we continue to see that too many people are not wearing masks, or for that matter, social distancing. As I've said before, being outside does not mean that a face covering is not necessary, or that being outside acts as a vaccine for this virus. Although we are currently in phase three of reopening and with the uptick in positive cases, the state has not ruled out stricter regulations on businesses and reduced gathering sizes. We don't want this to happen and we need to keep our focus on continuing to beat this virus in Newburyport. Tonight, I will be issuing an emergency order regarding use of face coverings in our downtown district, the waterfront, and the rail trail. In conjunction with the public health emergency declared by myself and the City of Newburyport's Board of Health on March 19, 2020, we will now require all persons entering these areas to wear a facial covering over their mouth and nose in public. This order applies to all places in the downtown, on the waterfront, and rail trail, whether indoors or outdoors. This emergency order is effective tomorrow, Friday, August 7th, and will remain in effect until notice is given pursuant to the Board of Health's judgment that the public health emergency no longer exists. We will post A-frame signs in key locations, noting the mask requirement, and staff will be monitoring these areas and passing out masks. Thank you in advance for your compliance with this order. Equally, if not more important, is the work being undertaken to return to school this fall. The school committee voted officially this past Monday to start school on September 16th, allowing the district more time to prepare for reopening this fall. The delay is permitted by the state, which is allowing the districts, districts to shave 10 days off the school year due to the challenges posted by the ongoing COVID pandemic. Superintendent Gallagher and his leadership team have also revealed that the district will not pursue a full in-person learning model right away and will instead lean more towards a remote or a hybrid model. Regardless of the model chosen, the plans will be refined if needs change during the pandemic. Dr. Jessica Lasky Sue, an epidemiologist with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and who joined the school's reopening task force has advised that each school in our district will face different challenges depending on the age bracket of the student 
and other factors. For example, younger students are more likely to have trouble understanding the importance of social distancing while in person. And older students at Newburyport High may be more likely to have an invincibility mindset or this idea that they are immune to COVID-19. High school students can also have individualized schedules, which makes creating cohorts or bringing groups of students together more difficult. The school committee will vote on the reopening plan on Monday morning, August 10th. Superintendent Gallagher will join me next week on my weekly address, where we will focus the time on a discussion surrounding the reopening of our schools. I would be remiss if I did not mention how disruptive COVID-19 has been in preventing our city from offering our traditional festivals, concerts, shows, and summer happenings. However, even in these trying and uncertain times, Newburyport Yankee Homecoming's president, Dennis Palazzo, and volunteers continued on with a few activities in a safe and social distant manner and as to not endanger our community. One of the many wonderful events with the festival was the delivery of barbecued chicken dinners with all the trimmings to 238 veterans and their families, replacing the traditional Yankee Homecoming Veterans Luncheon. It was a great success as well as the drive-in movie night. I wish to extend my sincere gratitude for everyone's efforts and we look forward to Yankee Homecoming 2021. Also, one of our favorite music festivals began yesterday, the Newburyport Chamber Music Festival called Summer 2020 Reimagined, where we will see quartet instrument caroling in the streets with no crowds and social distancing. Virtual individual performances and a live stream virtual concert from St. Paul's. The festival runs through August 17th. We hope you enjoy it. And kudos to our friends and colleagues at the Firehouse Center for the Arts who had to suspend operations during this pandemic, but who are up and running with virtual events such as Godspell at the drive-in and in whose words say, together we will rise. Your support of the center is appreciated at this time. The Newburyport Choral Society was also forced to cancel their annual spring concert, a favored and sellout event in our city. I would also like to welcome Ryan Turner as the new music director for the Newburyport Choral Society. There are just a few of our many arts and cultural programs and organizations who are bringing some joy and happiness to Newburyport when it needs it most. Thank you all. Last week, I announced an $800,000 joint grant award by the Department of Housing and Community Development to the cities of Newburyport and Amesbury. There are $10,000 grants for eligible businesses, which can be used for operating expenses such as payroll or rent or mortgage payments, or hiring a consultant to provide legal, accounting, marketing, and or web development services. To our local businesses, please take advantage of this opportunity. The application will be available mid-August. More information and eligibility requirements will be posted on the city's reopening page on the website, cityofnewburyport.com forward slash reopening. As a reminder, Pettengill House is administering a rental assistant program that provides for residents of Newburyport who are unable to pay residential rent due to circumstances related to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are pleased we've been able to support many qualified households and there is still funding available for, for those in need. So please do not hesitate to reach out to Pettengill House if you need help with one, two or three months of rental assistance. 
City Hall continues to meet with residents by appointment only and is encouraging residents to continue to use our online services for bill payment systems and vital records requests through the city website, cityofnewburyport.com forward slash online services. As I addressed last week, we understand that we have work to do in the pursuit of racial justice, inclusiveness, and equity in Newburyport. As a start, we will begin community conversations through forums and dialogues to discuss issues related to race, ethnicity, faith, and culture. You will hear more on this in the near future as we work alongside our political, religious, and business leaders, our Human Rights Commission, and community advocates. As a municipal leader, I recently signed the Municipal Leaders Pledge principles and action statement with other mayors and managers throughout the metropolitan Boston area. The pledge identifies five principles that will guide our efforts in community conversations to learn more from our black and brown residents and other ethnicities. Change in state oversights are recommended to address issues of police misconduct. We are also requesting funding for cities and towns for anti-racism training and education programs. Additionally, several anti-violence and anti-racism principles were identified, many which have already been adopted by our local police department. My signing this pledge as mayor of the city of Newburyport is not an indication that our police department needs to adopt a range of new policies and procedures, but rather a statewide support of changes that may be indicated or needed in our state. I am very proud of the men and women who serve in the Newburyport Police Department. We have worked hard to achieve and maintain certification, advance training, and utilize appropriate policies and procedures. Our use of force policy is one of the strictest and detailing prohibitive chokeholds and advances de-escalation. We have developed a strong community policing program and positive ward liaisons across the city. Please remember the men and women in our police department are our neighbors, our mothers, fathers, sons and daughters who live and raise their families in our communities. Lastly, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Please do your part in our community and wear a mask and social distance. We look forward to seeing you downtown with your face covering on. Thank you everyone, be safe and be well.